Um, let's start then. Welcome everybody for our weekly seminar. Uh, just after, after this um, break, this Passover break, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, today we are hosting our own uh, student from the department, um, Mr. Ernest Uzanski. Ernest made his uh, bachelor's degree in civil nuclear technologies in Vorogye State University, sorry if I didn't mention it right, in Russia, in 2015 and his master degree here in our department when finished it in 2018. His PhD studies is carried out under supervision of Professor Boris Katzenelson, also one of our colleagues, and cooperation with Professor Itzik Makovsky. His main areas of interest are underwater acoustics, acoustical, oceanography and applicational geophysics. During his studies, Ernest actively participated in more than 20 scientific conferences worldwide and in more than 30 scientific cruises in Lake Kinere, Eastern Mediterranean and um, the Dead Sea. Uh, in 2021, in 21, Ernest received uh, the best student paper award and the other World acoustic conference and exhibition and uh, Acoustical Society of America's Technical Committee on Acoustical Oceanography Travel Grant. Ernest is a member of the Acoustical Society of America, the Association for Sciences uh, of Limnology and Oceanography, and International Society of Limnology. Um, so with this word, we are uh, giving the podium to Ernest, who is going to talk about internal Kelvin waves in Lake Kinetic observation, analysis, theoretical, <clears throat> and experimental study of acoustics effects. So go ahead, the podium is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. So uh, let me start and share the screen. Uh, during the presentation, I will show some videos and play some sound. If there will be any problem, please unmute and tell me if the video will be muted. It should be unmuted, but just in case, please do not hesitate to uh, turn on the mic and, and speak. Uh, I know that not all of you are acousticians, so uh, I will not show you a lot of equations and a lot of acoustical stuff. So uh, I try to make it more uh, clear for a wide audience. So my talk is about internal Kelvin waves in Lake Kinneret, it's observation, analysis, theoretical and experimental study of acoustic effects. This work was performed with um, Boris Katznelson and Dr. Andrew Lunkov. Uh, just several slides as an introduction. Uh, first, internal waves. What what is an internal wave? Internal waves are gravity waves that oscillate within a fluid medium rather than on its surface. So if this is air, this is water surface. So surface waves, if you go to the beach, you can usually see the surface waves. But there are also waves underneath the surface in the water. And for instance, figure one shows the Atlantic Ocean water meets uh, Mediterranean sea water at the Gibraltar Strait, and uh, uh, the internal wave is being formed here. So uh, to exist, the fluid must be stratified, so the density must change with depth. For instance, the salinity here in this case, or it will be temperature change in case of Lake Kinneret that I will talk about later. Uh, internal waves can be very strong. They can oscillate with an amplitude of up to 100 meters. And they are very important in heat transfer, energy and momentum transfer to the ocean. They are also involved in oxygen and maybe involved in nutrient mixing in so-called the diapycnal mixing in the sea and in the ocean. Uh, they can also cause strong turbulence. And also from acoustic perspective, they uh, strongly affect sound propagation in the ocean. And uh, for instance, if we want to build an underwater uh, communication device or just to study uh, sound propagation for a long range, we need to take into account presence of internal waves. Uh, also, there are 
Kelvin waves. Kelvin waves is a special type of the gravity wave that was discovered by Sir William Thompson, who later became Lord Kelvin in 1879. And these waves are affected by Earth rotation. They are trapped along lateral vertical boundaries, such as coastline or mountain ranges. Uh, you can see here at the picture, if we place a pendulum uh, above the surface of the Earth, uh, you can write, uh, if you're interested, the Foucault pendulums in Google, and there are a lot of pendulums. Uh, there is one very interesting in France and in other countries that uh, experimentally show you that the Earth is rotating. So because of the rotation, the pendulum starts to deviate from its plane and uh, this direction of the rotation will be the same in the, I will show it on the next slide. So in different hemispheres, it will be different rotation. So the existence of a Kelvin wave relies on gravity and stable stratification as for every internal wave also significant Coriolis acceleration, which is due to the rotation of the Earth and presence of vertical boundaries. Uh, internal waves in Lake Kinneret, internal Kelvin waves. So first, the, as I said, they move cyclonically around a closed boundary, which means that they will always move counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and clockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, back in 2017, we carried out an acoustic survey with ADCP. Uh, we measured currents and the averaged water currents from zero to 20 meters water depth are shown here. So we can see that the prevailing current in the lake is a counterclockwise uh, direction. Also, the wave amplitude is largest at the boundary and the case from the distance from it. Based on the temperature data from the lake that we also measured, here is a, a model of the um, uh, thermocline oscillations. And we can see that in the deep part of the lake, this, this place is located here. And this is the shore. So let's say somewhere here. So the thermocline oscillations are the strongest near the shore and almost zero in the center of the lake. So we also placed uh, thermistor strings, which are simple temperature sensors at three stations in the lake. Here in the center of the lake, it's station aircraft, station F and station H. And we recorded temperature data for, for about one and a half, even more, about two years. So we have a long-term temperature oscillation data. And for instance, here shown for three weeks of June, we see that in the center of the lake, the oscillation of the thermocline is almost zero. It is stronger at shallower station F and it's the strongest at station H. Please notice that the depth here is different. So here the depth is 36 meters, here it's about 18 meters and here it's about 10. So if for station F uh, thermocline barely reaches 10 meters depth, then at station H, it can sometimes even reach the surface. And also during the winter, the water in Lake Inerit is, uh, the temperature of the water is almost constant. So the temperature profile for the winter, it's, uh, it barely reaches 20 degrees in winter at the surface, and it's about 16 degrees in the, near the bottom. But during the summer, stratification is very strong and temperature can be sometimes even above 30 degrees at the surface. Uh, the experiment. We actually carried out three experiments. The first one in 2018 and two experiments in April 2021 and uh, August 2021. 
uh, the results of the first experiment are already published, but the experiment was not very successful due to several malfunctions of the, uh, of the recording, audio recording systems. So we carried out two more experiments and the last one was 100% successful and results of this experiment I will show you in this presentation. So uh, we study acoustic propagation, sound propagation at this acoustic track from station T to station echo. So this is the bathymetry along this line we placed sound source at seven meters depth and we placed two vertical line arrays each having 10 hydrophones here in the center of the lake at station aircraft. I will show you the pictures a little bit later so I will show you the aircraft and this uh, barge where I had to live for about three days and so it will be more clear later. Uh, so sound source here uh, hydrophones here. This dotted line shows the horizontal position of the thermocline when it's um, in the position of the in the state of equilibrium. And these dashed lines show the possible deviation of the aircraft. Uh, I'm sorry, of the thermocline. Here at the aircraft, the deviation is zero, and it's as was shown before, strongest at the at the boundaries at the shore. And this picture also shows the um, uh, thermocline oscillations from its position of uh, the equilibrium. So what was the main idea? The main idea is that uh, the full circle internal Kelvin waves makes in 24 hours, approximately. First, the thermocline goes up here in the position of the source. After that, it goes back. During the noon, it crosses the equilibrium position. After that, it goes down and after that comes back. So it goes from this, from this location, it goes up, down, down, up. And the main idea was to radiate sound from the source recorded by the antennas and to do it for more than 24 hours to record the full circle of the, of the internal Kelvin wave. Also here shown the, the direction of the, of the rotation of the wave. So I think here should be several pictures. So this is the aircraft. It is a floating platform about 10 by eight meters it's like a small house small small floating house and uh, it has a lot of limnological equipment at it said it belongs to the iolar to the iolar lab of the uh, iolar canary lab uh, <laughs> probably this is not scientifically important but this white stuff is actually bird shit a lot of birds live here and first when you enter the site the smell is unforgettable so i remember my first experiment at this aircraft back in 2016 we had to spend here the whole day and you can't leave the place you're like being trapped inside of it and the smell is um, something but there are studies that the smell is kind of good for your health so it's why not uh, also this is not related to the again, to the kelvin waves but i recorded it during one of the, our experiments we were in the canary during the dust storm so it was recorded from the uh from the hotel that where we stayed this is lake canary so it's several hundred meters from it and there was very strong dust storm and I recorded such a beautiful lightning. Uh, also, this is the ADCP. It's acoustic current Doppler profile profiler. It has several uh, acoustical sources and receivers. 
and it is used to measure currents and backscattering strength. Uh, this ADCP we used to record the currents. This is the thermistor strings. They are about like 30 centimeters long. You program them, you place them underneath the water, and they can record uh, temperature very precisely for very long time. So sometimes even for several years without changing the batteries. And this is the research vessel Hermona. This is me. This is uh, uh, Senia and Moti from the IOLAR. And we were deploying the ADCP at one of the stations in the lake. Uh, this is the barge. So it's uh, this barge is pretty large. It's about uh, maybe 15 or maybe even 18 by 10 or by 8 meters. So it's about 150 square meters area. It is located right next to the shore, but the water, de but the seafloor depth here is already about 12 meters. So we decided to deploy our sound source here. We rented this barge for several days and uh, uh, I used to live at this barge for about three days. So uh, Boris used to come to, uh, to change me for some time, but uh, almost all the time I had to stay here. I had a bed and I had some food. Um, I could also go to the shore sometimes, but because we had all of the computers and all of the equipment here, so this was my home for several days. And the temperature during the last experiment in the shadow was about 41 degrees. And I got a very strong heat strike after the cruise, but fortunately it was very successful. So I'm very happy that we could, we could do this. So this is me in the beginning of the experiment of 2018. And after three days of the last experiment, I looked something like that. I was very happy that it was over in the end. And this is my bed, my sleeping bag, and some of our equipment. Uh, also, there was one funny story. We were radiating sounds from this barge and we rented this, this barge. So we told that we will make acoustic experiments and there will be no problems. And the sound that we radiated for about two days, it was not very loud, but relatively loud. So I can turn, off, turn on the video. So the music is actually here from the, um, from the restaurant, but the sound like wheel is the sound that we radiated. It's the chirp signal. And during of one of the nights, I was sleeping in the, in the bed and the sound was radiating. I had, to, I had to wake up about every hour to change the record. But uh, during the time I was sleeping and I saw the, the boat that was approaching the barge and I saw that it's a police boat. And it was about two o'clock at night and I was so scared because like you wake up in the middle of the night and the police boat is approaching and I don't know what to tell them because I don't have the phone of the guy who owns this barge. And uh, also my supervisor is, is not around, so I was a little bit scared, but fortunately they stopped, closed the barge and they went to the, to the restaurant, which is placed here. So they probably wanted to grab some coffee or take something to eat. So they didn't even talk to me, but that was the experience. Uh, also, um, during the last cruise, during the last cruise, when we were going from the aircraft to the barge, we saw a lot of, we saw a lot of rafts with a lot of kids on them. And um, the captain of the ship who lives 
in uh, Kibbutz Ginasar at the Kinneret. He told us that every summer, kids from all of the Israel, the pupils, the pupils from schools from all of Israel, from different schools, they go to this Kibbutz Ginasar. They live for several days in the tents, then make these this rafts, and after that they sail to another side of the lake. So this is how it looks. They were like tens of these rafts, maybe maybe twenty of them. So they make it from the tanks. These are the guards and they have, they have also the doctors to, to help them if help will be needed. And I was so inspired by this view that like, uh, I think it's very cool that students, the pupils, they can work in a team, they can build a raft and after that go to another side of the lake. And I think this is a very nice experience to have when you're a, when you're a kid. Um, and also several pictures of the views. This is how it looks in the evening. This is the moon. This is one of the birds. The views in Lake Inneret are gorgeous. And if you've never been in Lake Inneret, please go there someday. Uh, it is very beautiful. It's very beautiful in winter, in summer, in spring, in autumn, but please, Keep in mind that it's very hot during the summer, so uh, take a lot of water with you. And this is the sunrise at the barge. So every morning when I woke up, uh, I was meeting these beautiful sunrises and here are the, the Golan Heights So and the mountains. So back to the acoustics. Uh, also for some, to show you the signals that we radiated, this is the signal one meter from the source. And if we turn on the, uh, the spectrogram, we see that it's chirp signals from 200 hertz to 2 kilohertz. And of course, the, it's just one meter from the source, so we can clearly see the signal. Away from the source, it's 5.5 kilometers from the source. This is the row signal recorded by the antenna. So you can see that it's very noisy and you can probably even not hear it with your ears right now. So if we turn on the spectrogram, we can see these lines at the spectrogram. So even the raw signal we could see in the, um, in the experiment. But this is just for entertainment. So this is not the scientific part. Also, this, is, this was also a funny thing that the source that we used was, it's not was it, it is an underwater sound transducer. So you connect it to your laptop and use as the speaker to even play music. Of course, the frequency band of the source is lower than the speakers in your laptop, let's say. So, and also in the water, there is a lot of reflections from the surface, from the bottom, from this barge. But one day when I was uh, working at this barge, uh, kids of the owner of the barge, they came to this barge and started to ask me what I was doing, what are the acoustic waves, and they were asking me to show them the signals. And uh, I decided to make them an underwater music party. So I asked which music do they like? They said they like electronic music. So 
they were swimming underneath the water and I was turning on the music for them. So this is also the, just the example of the, of the music that is recorded underwater and played under the water. And the spectrogram, you can see that the strongest signal of our source is here, near the central frequency, but it goes through all the frequency bands. So the chirp signals were from 200 hertz to 2 kilohertz, and this music is like on the whole frequency band. So this is the music. And they were so happy and they were so like I remember that they were even like screaming in the water and they were very happy that like above the surface because of high reflection like almost no sound goes from water to air to the air so when you turn on the music you can barely hear it with your ears but when you go under the water then you can see not see you can uh, hear the sound very very clearly and I remember they were very, very happy. And so uh, I remember they brought me some food as a present. So they told the story to their parents and this restaurant also belongs to, to the owner of the barge. So they brought me a lot of food, which I was eating all the night. Now the, now the scientific part. Uh, also as an, uh, as an example of the data that we recorded, this is the row signal. This is time versus the amplitude. We can see that at the echo raft, we can barely see the signal, but after some processing, after doing the cross correlation with the radiated signal, we can see the sound pulses that we radiated and we can see them very, very clearly. And this is also the example of the, of these pulses radiated, but also for each channel, uh, for for each channel, this is just one hydrophone channel, and hydrophone is is the same. So when I say hydrophone, and hydrophone is the underwater microphone, and when I say channel, it's it is the same. So this is for one hydrophone near the bottom, and this is for ah no, I'm sorry, uh, I deleted this picture yesterday. So this is one pulse, and this is the same the same pulses, but with, with time. So they are, I cut them into parts and make, made a 2D matrix to show that there is a good consistency of the, of the pulses between one and another. And this is zoomed version of one of these pulses. So if we take this part, sorry, and we just zoom it, then the sound intensity will look like that. This is the noise level and this is the pulse. Now about the methodology, theory and comparison of the experiment with the, with the results. So I will show you the model number one, the simpler model. After that, briefly tell you the theory of mode coupling. After that, model number two, comparison and discussion. So first, sound fields can be represented as some of so-called acoustic normal. If you take, a, let's say, a string of the guitar and you play it, then the sound that is played on the string can be decom decomposed into the sine waves. And so let's say this is the mode number one. It has one peak. There is red mode number two. It has two peaks. So we can calculate the zeros, like it's, which is the same. Uh, mode number three has like three peaks and mode number four has four peaks and etc. So this is well known that sound field can be decomposed into these modes. And usually if we take flat bottom and just radiate some sound, the modes will not interact with each other. But in some specific cases, 
modes can interact with each other and they can transfer energy from one mode to another. And this transfer of energy is called the mode coupling. So um, here the idea was to take a simple case of this acoustic track to take the extreme locations of the aircraft uh, of the thermocline. I keep on mixing thermocline and aircraft, sorry. To take extreme locations, positions of the thermocline. So when it's in the equilibrium and when it's high and to calculate, to model sound fields, to decompose it to the normal modes. And after that, to compare, compare these two cases. So for this case, we took very simple case. The frequency is the central frequency of our source. We took the uh, very simple wedge. And we took also a conventional sound speed in the bottom. In Lake Inerit, the sediment is very gassy. So there is a lot of gas bubbles. And due to the presence of gas bubbles, sound speed is very low. It can be 300 meters per second, even 100 meters per second in some cases. So, but for this very simple case, we took very, very simple and well-known parameters. So the idea was to take the simplest model we can take to model these two extreme cases and to see whether there will be any difference between them. Uh, also, the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues were calculated using the crack and C. So we were using complex normal modes. Acoustic field was calculated in RAM using the parabolic equation and mode amplitudes were obtained from the decomposition of the sound field using the parabolic equation with the normal modes. So if we, these things are called the eigenfunctions. So if we plot the special variability of these eigenfunctions, the first four modes, case when thermocline is high, so when it's above the source and when it doesn't touch the seafloor, there is nothing special. The, the modes doesn't change their shape. They're just being stretched or shrinked along the track. So we can see that nothing really happens here. And if we take a look at the eigenvalues, then they also don't interact. They don't come closer to each other. So nothing special. But for the case when thermocline is parallel to the surface, we can see that the shape of the modes change significantly. And also the shape of the eigenvalues change significantly. We can see that for places where thermocline touches the seafloor, these eigenvalues, they start to approach each other and they approach consequently. So mod number one and mod number two, after some range, mod number two, uh, uh, two and three, three and four, and etc. cetera. Uh, now, the idea is to decompose the sound field into these modes and see how do they interact with each other. And, and also, the, as I said, the sources in the upper layer, it excites the so-called bottom surface reflective modes. During the propagation modes consecutively transform into the thermocline refractive modes. And the interaction goes also consecutively from one mode one and two, two and three, three and four. So now some theory that can describe it. Uh, here are just the basic equations. This is the storm will problem that helped us to find the local eigenfunctions. And this is the equation of the mode decomposition, mode amplitude decomposition. So this is the sound field, the eigenfunction and the density. So for each mode and for each range, for each depth, we multiply one by another, divide by the corresponding uh, density and after that integrate over the whole depth. And in the source, 
the mode amplitudes are simply these mode functions. So, uh, and also this was the idea of Boris. Boris found that there is a, a case in, in atomic physics when atomic levels are approaching to each other and there is interaction of them. And he suggested to see whether it can be done in acoustics, whether we will see this effect in acoustics. So this effect of closing of pair of modes is similar to the so-called quasi-crossing of atomic levels. In our case, it takes place where bottom surface reflected modes turns into bottom, bottom refracted modes. So this is once again the eigenvalues which approach each other. For a better view, we just subtract uh, eigenvalue of mode number one and two, after that two and three, three and four, four and five. And here we can see that the minimum distance between these eigenvalues. And we can see that here it's, it's better seen that they consecutively interact with each other. Uh, now, how can we roughly estimate this mode amplitude? So there is uh, landau zener which in atomic physics is known for a very long time, since 1932. So if we take these eigenvalues, we can approximate them as two hyperbolas. So this is just a zoomed part of this thing. So we can approximate them as two hyperbolas. This is the eigenfunction of mode number one. This is eigenfunction of mode number two. Uh, this hyperbola can be described as a simple function, y is kx. And knowing the distance between them and knowing the, uh, knowing the k, so knowing the shape of this hyperbola and knowing, wait a second, no, I, I missed one, one step. So we can, we can approximate these two hyperbolas as a, as a, also with a line with a slope and the slope is described as y is kx. And so in simple words, due to the, according to Landau-Zener formula, the mode excitation coefficient, which is p, can be calculated as the exponent of p omega squared, uh, it's gamma squared divided by 2k. And so the minimal distance between eigen, eigenvalues and the slope, so this um, gamma is the minimum distance between them, so it's from this point to this point is in our case uh, five to 10 in power minus three, one divided by, by meters and K. So the slope is, uh, is seven by the 10 in the power of minus five. And the amplitude of the fourth, first mode before interaction is 0 0.7. So according to this formula, the mode excitation coefficient is 0 0.6. And if we multiply the mode number one by this 0 0.6, we get about 0 0.4. And we can see that after the coupling, the amplitude of mode number one is about 0 0.4. So uh, we believe that this uh, two-level model of Landau-Zener can explain the coupling of modes in case when thermocline is touching the seafloor. Uh, now the second model, uh, let me check how much time do I have, uh, the more realistic model. So here we decided to analyze temporal variability of intensity at the vertical line array, because now we also need to somehow compared to the experiments that we carried out. So the experiment in August, once again, uh, this is the seafloor depth, the one of the antennas, the source. 
uh, the period of the internal Kelvin wave is about 24 hours. The chirp pulses we radiated are from 200 hertz to 2 kilohertz. Central frequency of the source is from 400 to 600 hertz. And we were radiating signals each 15 minutes for 24, more than 24 hours. For the modeling, we used the real bathymetry. We used real sound speed in the bottom, which we took 350 meters per second, about the special and temporal variability of gas content in shallow sediments of clay canary chicken in one of um, our papers and the central frequency of the source from 400 thermocline. If in the previous case, we took very simple model of the thermocline, which was a simple stair, here we took a realistic model of the thermocline. And once again, thermocline in 24 hours, it goes up, down and up. So we modeled the full circle of the thermocline. Uh, some animations, so if we, look at the transmission loss for different positions of the thermocline for a single frequency. This is once again, the sea floor, the thermocline, the source was here, and this is range. So we can see that interference pattern of the sound field uh, varies significantly. The intensity at the antenna here varies significantly. You can see that in some cases here, the color is blue, which is the lower intensity sound. And sometimes it is almost orange, which is a higher intensity sound. If we now, for easier analysis, if we sum and average intensity at each range through the whole depth, so if we take sum of this intensity, some of this intensity, some of this intensity, and we do it for a wide band signal, then we have something like that. Once again, the black is the bathymetry, and is the depth average transmission thing that For different locations of the thermocline, the variability of the intensity at the antenna varies significantly, and it varies by about 12 decibel, which means that in some cases, sound that we radiate here and record by the antenna will be three times, more than three times lower than in the other case, with no other changing of the parameters. So the bottom is the same the sound source is the same, everything is the same, but only due to the movement of the thermocline, the intensity of the sound can change by more than three times, which is pretty significantly. And also the range is 5.5 kilometers, so which is not so long. Uh, now let's compare the model with the experiment. So if we take this point, at the vertical line array for each moment of time and just plot it, we will get this picture. So here is the thermocline depth that is changing with time. And this is the depth average modeled field at the vertical line array. This is the model for a wide bed signal. We see that the lowest intensity will be when thermocline is in the horizontal position. So we assume that at this moment, the mode coupling is the, strong, the strongest. The highest intensity will be when thermocline is, is in, it, in its upper location. So uh, even though it doesn't reach the source, it still significantly reduces the transmission losses and the intensity will be higher. And so we assume that here there will be almost no mode coupling. And in some cases, there may be even no mode coupling due to the thermocline variability depth. And in the case when thermocline is low, intensity is 
is average. It's something between the lower case and the, the equilibrium case and the higher case. And this happens because I can, let's say, show you here. Um, when thermocline is high, then there is no interaction at all, or interaction starts somewhere here. And it's very weak. When thermocline is parallel to the surface, the interaction starts at about one kilometer range. And to these modes, they jump underneath the thermocline and then they interact much more time with the bottom and uh, the attenuation of the sound is higher. This is in simple words. But when thermocline is low, then there is no interaction until the almost end of the acoustic track. Then they may be the mode coupling in the end, but still it is not enough to attenuate the sound until the end of the, of the acoustic track. If the acoustic track will be like 20 kilometers long, probably this case and this case will be pretty similar. But this is another, another story. Uh, so this is the model. Then the experiment. Uh, when I was processing the data, I was surprised that we have a very nice agreement, almost excellent agreement with, with this model. The only one thing is probably the phase of the internal Kelvin wave. It could either change because it's not, it's not precisely 24 hours. And when I was making this model, it was several years ago based on the data from thermistor strings from 2017. And maybe there is some deviation and shift of this, of this internal Kelvin wave phase. But still like it's 24 hours, it's from let's say here nine o'clock to almost nine o'clock here. The minimum is here at about midnight. And here this maximum corresponds to this maximum, this corresponds to this. And this is the next maximum which corresponds to, to this, but on another day. If we look at another uh, antenna, which is the east antenna, we had one broken uh, hydrophone. So the results here are also in very good agreement with the model, but because one hydrophone was missing, then probably we can, we just don't have all the data from the whole water body. But still, agreement is, in my opinion, is excellent. Now, if we briefly, I will just take several more minutes. Now, if we briefly uh, take the field that we recorded experimentally and we decompose it by the modes. So if we take six modes at the location of the aircraft, here are the positions of the hydrophones hydrophones depth and so if we decompose this field into the modes then we get the mode amplitudes but it is hard to analyze them because in this way because the amplitude the intensity of the sound or the amplitude changes significantly and mode interaction can be much lower than this uh, sound field variability. So if we normalize the mode amplitudes for each range, so if we just simply do for each range, we calculate the sum of all mode amplitudes, so the total energy, and we normalize each value by corresponding value of the total, uh, the sum of the amplitudes, we get this picture, which is much more interesting. So uh, first, what we see is that modes amplitude, amplitude of the modes, it change not in the same way. So in some cases, amplitudes of some modes increases and there is corresponding decrease of amplitudes of another modes. And also we assume that our uh, theory is right because in the beginning the amplitudes 
of the of the modes correspond to to eigenfunctions at the position of the source. So here at seven meters, we can see that uh, mode amplitude of mode number one, two, and three it is very low. Three is a little bit higher, so this is the lowest. Higher, this little bit higher. Then mode number four is here. Mode number five is here and mode number six is here. So we can see that uh, in first approximation, they correspond very well. But when thermocline is in the position of its equilibrium, also we take into account that this might be shifted now. Uh, so somewhere here, we can see that there is very strong interaction of modes and they, their amplitudes change significantly. And after that, when thermocline goes back, uh, from the position of equilibrium when it goes down, the mode amplitudes, they go back to the amplitudes that they had. Uh, also, we saw one pretty interesting thing in the modeling. We didn't analyze it carefully yet, but as a preliminary case, I can show you this picture here. So this is arrival time of the pulse that we radiated and its arrival time to the vertical line array. So it takes about 3.7 seconds to travel from the source to the receiver. And it travels through the, through the water body with different temperature distribution. So with different stratification. So in some cases, this is the hot water and this is cold water. And uh, so in some cases, because it travels through the mainly through the hot water, it will travel faster because sound speed here is higher. And in other case, in this case, it will travel uh, lower. And also this is very, very pre preliminary. I don't want to make any sta statements right now, but it seems to me that the in some cases, like this is to be, this is the mix of the modes, of course, but in some cases we can see that probably mode number two or maybe even three, they can come in different uh, time. And what we also suppose is that there can be two, let's say second modes propagating at the same time. So we radiate uh, sound here, we radiate mode number one, two, three, four, etc but they travel with different sound speeds. In some case, there is interaction at some point, there is interaction of mod number two, which can generate mod number, of mod number one, which can generate mod number two. And we suppose that probably the new mod number two can start to propagate and the old mod number two can propagate before it. But of course, this is just a speculation right now and it requires further careful calculations of mode group speeds and consecutive analysis. But still, this seems very interesting for me and uh, we want to analyze it uh, further. Uh, three last slides about the discussion of the internal Kelvin waves. Of course, uh, this case that we modeled initially, let me go back. We will not see this case, of course. We will not see such a strong and prominent mode coupling as we saw here. Here, the bottom is uh, flat. The stratification is very strong. So this is just a simple stair. There is no smoothing and uh, thermocline is very, very steep. And also we took the extreme positions of thermocline here and there. So the picture that we saw here, where here, where there is such a strong interaction of modes, we will probably not see it. Or we can see very strong interaction, but it can be also due to other reasons. And uh, one of the possible reasons is, of course, the bathymetry, which will, in some cases, can lead to strong uh, mode coupling at steep angles. Also, thermocline is not a stair. Thermocline is is more smooth. And another thing that we noticed recently is the internal Kelvin wave itself. 
So first, and it's known for a pretty long time, this is modeling back from 2002, uh, based on four, four stations. Uh, this team modeled the currents in Lake Inerit. And for a long time, it was uh, supposed that this current occurs due to the internal Kelvin wave, due to the Coriolis force, and due to the Mediterranean sea breeze, which pass over the lake, and um, it can increase the, the perturbation at the surface and uh, cause this these currents because Mediterranean sea breeze always goes from, from one direction to another. And th this direction is, is the same all the time. And when we looked at the currents back in 2017, we averaged them over the 20 meters depth. And we saw, and also it was in November when stratification was already low we saw that the current is indeed counterclockwise and there were no problem. But this year in 2021, we took a DCP one more time. It was during the summer and we recorded the currents in the lake in the upper and in the lower, uh, parts of the water body, so above and underneath the thermocline. And it occurs that uh, in the upper part of the thermocline of the water body, above the thermocline, the direction is counterclockwise as it was, as it was before, but underneath the thermocline, the rotation can be clockwise, which is into the opposite direction. And also, we suggested that it can happen due to so-called uh, dissipative centrifugal instability, which due to friction of water and the seafloor, it can, in some cases, change the direction. But also, this is another story. And uh, we published some proceedings about that and talked about it in some conferences. And we will hopefully publish it soon in the peer-reviewed journal. So still there is a lot of uncertainties about the internal Kelvin wave. And it, this is the question of another study. Uh, the summary, internal Kelvin wave causes strong spatial temporal variability of sound field and change the mode composition at the vertical line array. The mode coupling occurs when thermocline is in its lower position, when it touches the bottom. When thermocline is in its upper position, it's adiabatic mode propagation, which means that there is no transfer of the energy between the modes. The transmission losses at the vertical line array change by more than 10 decibel, both in the model and the experiment. Uh, simulations are in excellent agreement with the experiments, and I'm still very, very happy because of that. Uh, mode coupling analysis now should be performed for a realistic case using approaches described here. So now the next step, and this will be hopefully the last step of my PhD, we will decompose modes for this case. So we will once again model the broadband signal from 200 Hertz to two kilohertz and we will decompose for each frequency the field into the modes. And then we can carefully compare the experiment to the model. Um, this is all. Thank you for your attention. And this picture, this GIF, I also uh, found on Quora when I was looking for animations showing the uh, uh, how this uh, Foucault pendulum works. And just here you can see that the further we go from the equator, the stronger will be the deviation of this uh, plane. Because when we are near the equator, then there is no change of the plane of the pendulum. And it will just oscillate in one plane with no change. 
when it's in the northern hemisphere, then we can see that the, it moves counterclockwise. And when it's in the southern hemisphere, we can see that it moves clockwise. So this is just a nice picture. Uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be glad to get any questions if we have time for them. Hey, thank you very much, Arnett. Very interesting talk. Uh, we congratulate you. I'm open the podium for people who, for our audience, who wants to ask questions. May I ask you hey. one question, please? Can you hear me? Yes, Sorry. yes, I'm listening. Ah, okay. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk, Eric. Uh, it was very interesting, especially uh, about some non-scientific events around your experiments. Uh, but uh, I would like to ask you about uh, mod coupling and uh, about mod uh, decomposition. Uh, as uh, I can see, um, you obtain that uh, mod number four uh, has uh, the highest amplitude uh, among other not normal modes, yes. Uh, as I understand, uh, uh, mode number one should be uh, should have yes uh, the highest amplitude due to the lowest uh, attenuation. But here is another another case, as as I understand. Uh, what do you think uh, about it? Why why is it so? Uh, thank you for your question, Andrei. Uh, I agree that mod number one, so also for the audience, uh, I can draw it very simply that uh, if this is the sea floor and we have sound source here and this is the sea surface, then mod number one will, let's say, propagate something like that. So it's almost in horizontal direction and mod number two, also in very, very, very simple words, it will it interact with the, with the bottom. So because mod number four interacts with the bottom more than mod number one, then its attenuation should be lower and its amplitude should be uh, also lower. And mod number one should have the, higher, the highest uh, amplitude. So the thing that now, comes to me is that probably the radiated amplitude is lower. I mean, the amplitude of the radiated mod, mod one can be lower than amplitude of the radiated mod four, because in the unperturbed case, where is, I, I lost my, uh, sorry. Uh, my mouse just doesn't work, so by some cases I will just say in words. So in the beginning of the line at about uh, midnight, when uh, we assume the thermocline is low or when it's high, then the amplitude of mode number one is, is low and then it, it, it increases. And mode number four is high and then it decreases. Right, so due to the coupling, actually the attenuation of mod number four seems to be higher, but the radiated mod number four seems for me to be more intense than mod number one. Or maybe here is just any noise in the data that we didn't take into account. I, I don't know, I have only this answer for now. W what do you think, what can be the reason for that? I don't know the reason. The, this this is the reason I asked you this question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So I suppose that the when mode is radiated at the source, the mode number one can be less intense than mode number four. But we can check it in the further modeling. We can model it and we can see the distribution of intensity of each mode at the source. 
Also, the dependence can be non-monotonic. Uh, well, uh, and it's also always necessary to calculate exact values of uh, attenuation coefficients, especially when you have this bubbly bottom. Uh, Pavel, could you please uh, explain it in more more details, please? I'm just saying that uh, while well, uh, normally, indeed, uh, the attenuation increases with increasing mod number, but uh, it's not always the case. And uh, in each specific case, especially when you have uh, such complications as thermocline and uh, bubbly bottom, you always have to check. But maybe in certain cases, uh, well, the attenuation can depend on the mode number non-monotonically. Ah, got you. Thank you. I will. You, you can down. just. I mean, you you can just compute mode attenuation coefficients. Uh, yes. Yes. If I, you have Craig and C, and you yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you, can, can, you can check. Yeah, it will be the complex value of the complex part of the eigenvalue, so we can. Yeah, imaginary part, right? The imaginary part, right? Thank you very much. Somebody else has a question. Okay, if no questions, so we close. Uh, may, may, I, may I ask one more question, please, if possible? Just a short one, because we are far beyond uh, our time. Okay, very short one. So, um, Ernst, uh, well, when you have a downslope propagation uh, and the thermocline is high, you said you expect absolutely no uh, mode interaction. But uh, I would expect that there is some mode interaction when uh, well, uh, you, you reach the cutoff depth of some uh, next mode, let's say, if you have, a, let's say, five modes at the source. And then when you reach the depth where the sixth mode appears, and I would also expect some mode coupling. Mm -hmm. well, so, uh, somewhere can you somewhere here, that? right? Where? Do you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, somewhere here. Let's say there is no, there was no mod four before before this depth. Ah, and... yes, yes, correct. Yeah, like that, like that, but also with high thermocline. Mm -hmm. So can you see that in your data somehow? Well, the interaction with newborn modes. Uh, we we saw some interaction. It was very weak. So we modeled because here. If we zoom it here, so let me uh, let me zoom it here. So here, just for a very small time, let's say we can see that mod number four doesn't exist, and after that it appears. So and this should be due to the mod coupling because some energy should be from somehow go to mod number four. So we. I can just a second. So, um, I can send you the just the picture and the slides because we were preparing a, a paper, a small paper about it. So in order not to take a, a lot of time, so I can just send you the slide. Great, great, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. I think we need to conclude because we are late. Um, so thank you everybody and, and see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. Thank you. Annie. Thank you.